last time on Metroid Prime. Are those rocks already burning up in the atmosphere? That's perfect for my ball! This space pirate broke his spine! What do you get when you take away ventilation in a spaceship? Hey, looks like he's pretty flaccid right now. Hello, mama, I'm home! Very slow-moving explosion! Yeah! You s- RTX fucking on, my dude! I need to get that morph ball down from that top shelf, and I am too short to reach it! That wasn't even close. Oh god, it tickles! I hate that. It's Grisby! Thank god Samus' suit isn't doing that right now. Babies must sleep. Choni Chozo. It's dripping. Stealth camo up in here. Now back to me, Troy Prime. What's up, bitches? I'm home! Oh good, that makes my job a little easier. Yes, come one, come all. Come to mama to face your death. So one of the first times I ever played Metroid Prime as a kid was borrowing it from a friend. They couldn't play the game without having the TV muted because the ambience kind of freaked them out. We were pretty young, we were still in elementary school, but I didn't feel the same until I got to the Space Pirate music. I don't know what it is, obviously I'm over it today, I'm in my fucking 20s, but back then as a kid and even somewhat into my middle school years, this music just freaked me out. I always love looking back at how much of a wimp I was with this kind of stuff. I'd, I'd literally got nightmares as a kid from the open opening boss of Mega Man Legends. I can't stress enough how stupid I was. So I don't exactly know what this is implying. This log says that Phazon binds to Phazon Ore, and I think that that means that they're using Phazon to attract more Phazon in the mining process, kind of like using a metal detector to find shit at the beach. Whatever the case, Phazon does bind to stone fairly well, and thermal imaging can be used to make any vulnerable cleavage points visible to break down the stone easier, which they later use to easily identify concentrated Phazon in their test subjects as weak points so that they could put them down if they grow too unstable. And one of those test subjects for this, a Project Titan, has been acting up recently and moved to Fendrana's quarantine caves. You know, reading this, I would expect some big monster with rocks bound to it, not, uh, you know. Welcome to the Pirates Hydra Labs, their Fendrana research base. Did I mention there's pirates here too, making their return from the Orphean? Yeah, I, I shouldn't need to, actually, what am I saying? These ones have their organs intact. It's also a neat bit of world building to show that the space pirates are more than just a single race of lobstermen. There's concept art for a space pirate that looks a lot like these crustacean boys, but showing that it's an intergalactic group that other species have opted into, it makes the universe feel bigger. And it's not like it's a completely different group of space pirates either. I mean, these guys were able to rebuild Ridley and also had Metroids from Zebes. Now, it's totally possible that these actually are the same breed of space pirates from Super Metroid, and it's merely an art direction change. Kind of like Zero going from Mega Man X to Mega Man Zero. He didn't get a makeover with a new armor in canon, this is just a completely different artistic interpretation. I wish that wasn't the case, I love the Archie comics interpretation of having this neat little in-between design for the hunters, but the Archie comics are anything but canon. This is a Metroid video, so I'm gonna end this topic here before I get too off track. Given how delicately handled the lore in this game at least tries to be, I think it's more likely that this is a different species. Anyways, I hope you guys have some popcorn on hands because I'm about to take a massive lore dump on each and every one of you right now. Talon 4 wasn't always in the pirates' crosshairs. In fact, it was the Phazon Meteor that brought the pirates' attention here roughly 20 years ago, long after this tribe of Chozo were wiped out. Now, the time between the Chozo dying and the Meteor crashing down, I am not entirely sure. Could have just been a few minutes, could be fucking centuries, I have no idea. But we'll talk about the Chozo in just a little bit. Phazon, as we see it in these pirate bases, has heavy regulations around them for the pirate's safety. And if regulations exist, it means that some poor soul really fucked up to inspire these rules. Pirates exposed to raw Phazon developed simple radiation sickness, and in uncommon cases, violent mood swings and hallucinations. Yeah, how much you want to bet that they thought that they were seeing ghosts? Yeah, those weren't hallucinations, my guys, though the local wildlife had been a bit more fortunate. Well, assuming that you consider not dying while exposed to radiation fortunate. The pirates would totally be the kind of people to say that Phazon only kills 2% of the people that it infects like it's a good thing, completely ignoring the worst case of space tumors they've ever experienced. Knowing this, though, they began willfully exposing the wildlife to Phazon, hoping to create some beneficial mutations. It's kind of like what we've been doing to various vegetables over the last few years. I remember being told in high school that this is how we created the modern strawberry. I'm not sure how true that is, but speaking of big, fat, and juicy mutations, making it to the top of the Hydra Labs, we learned the expected.
We knew that they recovered Metroids from Turian, and this is where they've set them up shop. Which, you know, makes sense given the cold environment. Those little fuckers hate the cold, even when infused with Phazon, kind of. A specific new Phazon mutation for the Metroids can even be seen in these holograms for the rooms. Logs suggesting that Phazon has impacted their ability to drain energy, but mutated their fangs into tentacles. Hey, just like their artwork from the NES manual. I wonder how much of that is a coincidence. Probably all of it. In literally any other version of this game, we would actually see this mutation in Fendrana. But here in the first NTSC release, we won't see these guys until damn near the end of the game. What they don't mention here is that unlike SR388 or ZBs before it, whose atmosphere tended to spark beneficial mutations in the Metroids, Metroids on Talon 4 seem to have actually regressed a bit. Every Metroid we see in this game is born without a mouth, leaving their talons <laughs> the only method of leeching energy from their prey, resulting in weaker Metroids in general, left vulnerable to conventional weaponry on top of their susceptibility to ice. The pirates are just as baffled by these things as we are. They've been able to isolate the equivalent of a digestive tract, spanning from the Metroid's fangs to their nuclei, but with no idea of what this energy they're draining is and how they're consuming it. But whatever it is, the pirates believe that they can use this for their ascension, which I believe is a leftover fragment from an original plot point of the story. An earlier draft draft of the game suggests that Phazon wasn't from outer space, but in fact the life energy from Metroids that had been scooped up from their remains in Torian, being spliced into other pirates' DNA via cloning. There's not too much known about Phazon from these earlier drafts to my knowledge. The idea of the pirates figuring out how to drain Metroid juice would open some pretty interesting plot holes up for later in the canon. The pirates' drive to figure this out though didn't last too long, opting to try to weaponize the Metroids rather than trying to reverse engineer them. A few Metroids could wipe out armies they say, shifting their goals into trying to eliminate the weakness to cold through phase on infusement. Spoiler alert, they succeed in this but don't even know it. Oh, we'll see that much later in the game. Also, just wait until a completely unrelated group of space fascists succeed in figuring this out too. Uh, also, this plot point is retconned in the trilogy release of Prime 1 because we need to make the pirates even dumber than they currently are. Oh, holy shit, a horizontal door! I'm gonna jump through it. I'm gonna fucking jump through it. Yeah! The pirates have been having a bit of an ice beetle infestation down here. I can only imagine that this is what the turrets are for. Oh, you know, that actually explains a lot. These turrets were made for dealing with ground burrowing slow beetle fuckers, not intergalactic radioactive parasites that could climb any fucking surface. No wonder the Orphean fell as fast as it did. You think these ones are susceptible to overloading? Haha, <laughs> oh, that's funny. These fuckers got a whole ass holographic observatory of the solar system. Let's get this shit booted up, fellas. All right, roll call. Billium, or is it Bilium? Uh, Billium sounds funnier. A planet overtaken by a sentient virus. Twin tabula, named after a prominent disease on the planet inducing double vision on anyone exposed to the atmosphere. Or mean, a wasteland covered in a nuclear winter. The planet of the week, Talon IV, a once thriving Goldilocks planet predicted to become a wasteland in the next 20 years. And our dear old maybe home planet, maybe not Zeebs. A barely habitable planet with a favorable crust for living below the surface. This is how you know that this is a prequel before reading anything else in the game because this shit is still the solar system. Also, some of these planets are going clockwise and the others are going counterclockwise, which might mean that some of these are exoplanets that got caught in the star's orbit. When solar systems are formed from space dust, I assume that everything that clumps up orbiting that center of mass would all go the same direction, kind of like a toilet bowl. I mean, maybe not. I'm not an expert at this. I just think it's cool and I read about it. A lot of my knowledge comes from books that I read when I was growing up and probably were heavily simplified so that dumbass kids like me could understand it. So much like a lot of my YouTube comments section when it comes to sex and gender expression, I should probably check some up-to-date papers and try to educate myself to be a better person. All right, are you ready for a short break from the lore? Do you want to blow some shit up? Uh, me too. Hell fucking yeah, super missiles are back. 
kind of. This is more of an extension of our regular missiles. Not like in Fusion, where all of our missiles are upgraded to super missiles as a flat upgrade, but a beam combo that costs us five regular missiles to use, activated by pressing the missile button while charging the power beam. We get different combos for the other beams later on. This isn't to be mistaken with the beam combos from Super Metroid that used power bombs as ammo. Honestly, it's totally possible that Prime's beam combos weren't even inspired by this. But in terms of beam combos, Prime 1 really blows its load early. The super missiles are objectively the most efficient. There's no contest. That's not to say that the other ones are bad, but this thing does six missiles worth of damage, basically giving you a whole ass free missile, making this great for boss fights. And are you ready for some motherfuckers to try them on? All right, you only need three missiles to take these guys out, so you're technically wasting two missiles by using a super missile. Well, fuck it, have some fun, dude. It's not like they're gonna be hard to come by later on. Fuck it, obliterated, holy shit. Ah, speaking of the jellyfish devil, I have it in my notes that this is record time for encountering a Metroid this early in the campaign, and that I forgot about all of Metroid 2. This one's name is Starence. Hey, I did it! Look at Starence! All right, I'm sorry. No more brain scratch references that are also Homestar Runner references in disguise. Actually, no promises. <laughs> Killing Metroids without the Ice Beam just feels so fucking wrong. I know Zabezian Metroids could also be killed by three power bombs, but come on, those are like fucking mini Davy Crockett's. Uh oh. I mean, I totally meant to do that. Get his ass, little dude! Oh my god, it tanked a super missile. These guys are not as wimpy as I thought keyword is as wimpy. It shouldn't be any surprise that the pirates are trying to infuse themselves with Phazon to create super soldiers. Codename Project Helix. Yeah, you see that vat of giblets there? That was one of their volunteers for their super soldier program. The elite pirates. The giblets in this tank though, specifically Experiment 7526, are the remnants of an enemy cut pretty early into the production of the game. Concept art exists for this creature, and we can piece together what it would have looked like by stitching together all of these giblets that are in this tank. It was intended to be a Frankenstein's monster of a pirate project, with a lobster claw of the original crustacean space pirates designed for the game, the abdomen of what I'm assuming is a giant war wasp, and unmistakably the head and body of a Gamma Metroid, spouting tentacles that would have foreshadowed a certain phazon infused Metroid that we'd see at the end of the game. I didn't even realize that that was a Gamma Metroid until I saw a post by that Metroid guy. Uh, nice name, by the way. We should join forces and take over this godforsaken Earth. Maybe start the Legion of Guys. I don't know. This would have been a really ambitious enemy. It's a shame that we never got to see it realized, but at least parts of it made it into the game. Literally parts of it. It giblets. On top of violently losing test subjects for this, Project Titan has been placed on indefinite hold. Whatever it is, they're having a hard time taming it, and the casualties just aren't making it worth it. Yeah, that's great. I'll have to put it down with my own two hands. Or cannons. Cannon. Singular. Oh, hey, there's those ice beetles. Hey, Cap, and I think you missed a spot. Oh, this room is uncomfortably dark. Oh, great, they're here too. Well, if the power's gonna go out, some night vision is gonna come in handy. Or thermal vision, that's good enough. Good thing my suit is compatible with this kind of tech. I'm assuming this is either Chozo in Origin or the power suit, it really is just that modular. I'm guessing that since I could use my scan visor to decode their shit instantly, it's probably the latter. The suit might actually come in handy for some espionage. Metal Gear Metroid when? Are you telling me that this entire facility's power was hinging on that thing's force field? That's fucking convenient. Though on top of being able to see in the dark, we can now see conduits that are inside of the walls that could be powered up with the wave beam, and can also see shadow pirates while they're cloaked. Though the missiles won't home in on them while they're cloaked, even if you're locked on. I guess I just assumed that these things were Bluetoothed into Samus's suit to determine homing coordinates. Whatever, I guess that's a fair trade. 
does the wave beam provide enough voltage to keep that thing running? Uh, actually, yes, it does. You never have to come back to repower these conduits when they're charged. I'm guessing it's jump-starting a generator somewhere behind the scenes. This thing could solve a goddamn energy crisis. Goddamn. Oh, it's one of those security bastards from the cutscene. Oh, that's much more than just a camera. That thing's packing heat. Yes, grow, my beautiful child. Grow big and strong to destroy your captors. What? Hey, remember those cordite structures back at the Chozo Ruins? Why is this thing over pirate tech? I know that these structures were formerly Chozo, but why are there space pirate nodes under these? The space pirates never struck me as trying to be respectful to religious sites and structures. Hello, Quarantine Cave. I'm here for your Titan. It's a rock! It's more rocks! Oh, my arm! Oh my god, Linus has been watching too much Galaxy Quest! Say hi to Titan. I mean Thardis, a sentient being of Phazon-infused stone. Sure is nice of the pirates to give this guy a proper name after locking him up in this room. I would love to know more about the biology of this thing. Like, we have carbon-based life forms on Earth with barely anything resembling a consciousness. Meanwhile, Phazon is able to give chunks of primarily silica tetrahedra a full-blown consciousness and instincts of self-preservation. Okay, so I actually had to look that up. Silica tetrahedra accounts for roughly 95% of the Earth crust. This molecule is one part silicon and four parts oxygen. And we've observed vegetation and photosynthetic algae with silicon as part of its natural structure. So I guess the likelihood of some radioactive primordial soup laying the groundworks for a silicon-based life form is one of the less far-fetched pieces of fiction that this game is trying to sell us on. Granted, that takes this 100% impossible piece of fiction down to, say, 95%, but that's still fascinating to me. This guy was conceptualized as the boss of Magmore Caverns, or quote, the boss of a large lava pit arena, which is heavily implied to be Magmore. Maybe this was still planned to be in Fendrana, and this place just happened to have a lava pool in it at one point, but I doubt that that's the case. This boss room originally housed a six-limb ice gorilla, and was replaced by Thardis due to time constraints while he was being worked on for Magmore. But hey, that's okay. That design didn't completely go to waste, and was finally reused and given life in Metroid Federation Force. And you know what they were called in that game? The Ice Titans. Remember what Thardis' codename was? Project Titan? That is a funny coincidence. Oh god, he's photosynthesizing! Uh, he does this thunder move like twice in his entire fight. Once to fog up the arena and the other to clear the fog? Okay, that makes less sense to me. You fight this guy by switching to your thermal visor and blasting at the chunks of concentrated Phazon as they appear. Once that Phazon touches oxygen, it just overloads the thermal visor for some reason. Your thermal visor gets overloaded in Magmore Caverns, which makes sense. But nothing else in the game, at least to my knowledge, overloads your visor outside of environmental factors. Anyways, just repeat this cycle until the boss eventually dies. It's pretty straightforward, but I love that it ends with destroying the central chunk on his chest. It's a great way to cap off the fight in a way that's really satisfying. Hey! That's it! You just lost your ball privileges! Go! Alright, so was this just powering Thardis, or what the fuck happened here? Also, holy shit, the spider ball is back. It's wild to think that the spider ball never returned for another original 2D Metroid game. The closest we got is its successor in the spider magnet, which I guess would be a good name for this thing too, since the spider ball in this game can only use these magnetic tracks rather than adhering to any surface. Which, yeah, that would be really busted for a 3D game like this. Frankly, that would be busted for most games, and it's a miracle that they made it work in Metroid 2. Hey, at least we could get a move on now. Alright, never mind, go fuck yourself. Oh hey, ain't that convenient. The elevator to Magmore near Thardis leads us to one of the few rooms at Magmore Caverns that doesn't overload the thermal visor. That's because you need to use it for this timed morph ball puzzle by activating three conduits in the room. It's a fun little puzzle, using multiple tools in Samus's kit to cool down paths of magma in sequence to get this energy tank. Also, uh, this might have showed up earlier in the game, but I love this music that kicks in when you're doing some kind of timed or multi-switch puzzle. It's really charming, you know? Oh 
my god, it's spore spawn! Or magma spawn. That is close enough. Oh shit, is this the room that I think it is? Uh, hold on, let me see if I remember how to do this. Fuck it, I'll just come back later. Come one, come all to play Crush a Magmore. <laughs> Let's go again! <laughs> Two points! Ah, he's back. Hold still, motherfucker. I still need to scan you. Thank you. Normally low temperature at the ruins. You mean that malfunctioning furnace, or do you mean something like the ice beam? At least I could climb up this way back to Flagra's chamber with the spider ball and these cordite things not being a bother to me anymore. I could have worded that so much better. Let me try one more time. I could break these now. Fuck your spider ball bomb jumping puzzles and fuck your oculuses. Oculi, whatever. I could just go around. Uh-huh. Yep, that looks normal. Uh, that part is not. All right, before we get too much further, let me catch you up on the Chozo lore real quick. As we know, the Chozo tribe of Talon 4 amputated itself from the technology of the previous tribes. Not out of malice, but as a way to become one with nature of the universe. Bridges made from branches, hallways caressed by pure waters, as they said. And at the highest point of their civilization was a wellspring of pure water that flowed across their camps. Believing that this spring water could offer glimpses of the past and future, and warning of a pouring darkness across the planet. This tribe still partook in the ritual of building their own breeds of Chozo statues, which the other tribes have intentionally littered across the solar system as a symbol for their peace in lands that they think only know war, threatening that anyone who defaces or destroys their statue will only face their wrath, which is probably the most imperial shit I've heard about the Chozo up until this point. I guess these guys were an offshoot of the Makid tribe, but nevertheless, they left their statues here as a sign of their hospitality. And also, if it wasn't clear to you before, it wasn't the Phazon Meteor that wiped out this Chozo. Instead, they passed away peacefully with the goal of becoming one with the planet. I'm guessing they just didn't have children to surpass them. It was actually the Phazon Meteor that woke their rusting spirits against their will, all as the planet they bonded with had been brought corruption. They feared that this was the sign of a prophecy, a worm born from parasites nurtured in a poison womb, spreading rot they could only observe. As for the prophecy also speaks of a great defender bearing ancient armor and weapons of the Chozo. The concept of there being an afterlife and ghosts in the Metroid universe is a little wild to me, but these ghosts are tangible enough to have been influenced by the Phazon, its corruption reaching this plane of the paranormal, driving the Chozo spirits mad and crumbling their wills and minds. And so as their last attempt, their last stand to save the planet that they considered home, they focused the last of their energy to construct the Cradle, a temple to contain the Phazon meteor set afloat above the impact site, separating it from the rest of the planet, and at its heart, a cipher, a mystical lock powered by 12 artifacts containing the last of the power they could muster in their ethereal state. The deed had been done, many Chozo disappearing from the rest and struggling to focus in the present time, stuck in a flux observing past, present, and future. And in this flux, they see their great defender. Samus, as she hunted the corrupted, giving the Chozo a glimmer of hope before their passing beyond the beyond. Or so they think. In reality, their spirits had become corrupted, honoring only destruction and disruption, believing life to be taunting them, manifesting into physical forms through sheer envy, an anger that was only amplified when the pirates arrived on the planet. A second plague, they call it, a marauding force that attempted to invade their cradle to no avail. The pirates may have uncovered fragments of the cipher, but don't don't know of its purpose yet. They're blinded by delusions of power from the Great Poison and assimilate their sanctuary into their expanse. Their hope only remains in Samus, the once fledgling orphan of a savaged planet, their warrior clad in Chozo armor, wielding weapons their hands once held, fueled by a righteous fury. 
Before their spirits could give into the darkness, they left these messages for Samus, praying that she could retrieve these artifacts, complete the cipher, and destroy the worm of the cradle, vowing that if their spirits must turn to aggression and destruction, that the violence they commit against these pirates will be a necessary evil. And all of that is ignoring the pirate lore. Uh, anyways, these Chozo ghosts are here to harass us a bit, and I know that some of you guys have some really strong opinions about these guys. You can't go 10 minutes into a discussion about Metroid Prime without someone bringing up that the Chozo ghosts are a hit against this game. And to be honest, yeah, I kind of agree. I really hate fighting these guys, but I think that you're supposed to hate fighting them until we get an item way later in the game that turns them into a complete joke. I I'm not gonna say that they're fun though, even with this item. And they don't always lock the door when they appear. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I don't exactly know what triggers this, but more often than not, especially in the later game, you could just fucking leave the room while they spawn. Though we have no option here but to fight these ones, and for now I'm gonna rely a little bit more on my radar so I can see them when they appear. They're immune to everything except for our power beam, however that also means that by extension they're weak to our super missiles, which definitely eases the frustration down a bit. You have to deal with these guys more reactively rather than aggressively, which sounds an awful lot like criticisms that I hear against the Marauders in Doom Eternal, except I love fighting the Marauders so obviously there's more to it than that. So do you think that these ghosts remembered the Chozo artifacts or that they just happened to be here? Also, am I killing them in their ghost state or am I just making them take a rest? Because they will respawn if you re-enter the room. So I guess I just want to know if those are new ghosts or the same ghosts that have just recovered. Before we take this video any further, I want to take just a moment to thank today's sponsor, Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep provides premium customized mattresses made to suit your sleeping needs shipped right to your door. Everybody sleeps differently. I've always been more of a belly down kind of sleeper myself, and finding the right mattress to fit my belly sleeping needs has always been an annoying game of trial and error. Helix offers to help circumvent this with their sleeping quiz, matching you with the perfect mattress to suit your sleeping needs and preferences. By accounting for your height, weight, firmness preference of the mattress, and what position you like to sleep in, or even if you don't know what position you like to sleep in and you tend to toss and turn in your sleep, Helix will match you with the mattress that is right for you. Even if you sleep with a partner, you can get it customized to fit both of your personal needs in one single mattress. I was matched with a Helix Midnight Lux. I've been sleeping on this thing for about the last four weeks and I don't think I've ever slept this well in my adult life. It's got medium firmness and just the right pressure points on it to let me sleep on my stomach as comfortably as ever. Sometimes I'd even wake up laying on my back, which is something that I'd never caught myself doing before now. I used to think that my old mattress was incredible, you know, with a memory foam pad on top of it and then another memory foam pad on top of that. But but the Midnight Lux has been incredibly cozy, no extra layers needed. Even their dream pillows were a surprise for me. And that means a lot coming from a man who sleeps with upwards of five to seven pillows on their bed at one time. I'm an adult in my mid twenties and I sleep in a pillow fort. How's your life going? Helix delivers right to your door with free shipping in the US, coming rolled up in a box that is remarkably easy to set up. Aside from Helix's 10 year warranty on their mattresses, Helix also provides flexible payment options and financing, and even a 100 day sleeping trial if your bed isn't a right fit. They'll come by, snag it up from you, and get you the mattress that you need or your money back. I love my Helix mattress, and I think that you will too. So be sure to click the link below or visit helixsleep.com forward slash Trev and get up to $200 off of your Helix mattress. Thank you so much for sponsoring this piece, and now let's get back to the video. All right, if we're done with these ghost stories, I'd like to take a quick trip to the bowling alley. Roll me, big bird! Awesome! If you ever wanted to know why the Chozo statues are always posed like this, uh, it's presumed that they're holding their hands out as if asking an offering for their dead. Which I'm assuming is unique to Talon 4, because why are the ones on Zebes always holding experimental Chozo weaponry? You'll need to come back to this room every time you get one of the new beams of the game, with all three of these bomb slots up here corresponding to each of them. Send me once more, bird father! Fascinating. It's just so beautiful, I don't know what to say. Oh 
no, no, the fish. Oh God, what the hell? How could this get any goddamn worse? Oh God, please reel this back. I need a win. Yeah, okay. Okay, this does help. Thank you for the shotgun ice, oh great Chozo gods. Look at the way the ice covers her arm cannon while charging. That is so cool. So cool, in fact, that this just isn't present in the Wii part of the game. Actually, they cut out all of the unique charging effects for the beams. It's just that the ice beam one is the most obvious and is the only one that people noticed. Oh, please, oh, please, just one more bowl and I'll be out of your life for a little bit longer. Oh shit, that pirate's got brain damage. It's fucked up. Is he friendly at least? Damn, okay. Gee, all these injured pirates is sure reminding me a lot of- uh, Oh, that just straight up is the Orphean. Was that self-destruct sequence really enough to send this thing retrograde enough to plummet into the atmosphere? Never mind, I don't think this series cares about interplanetary physics that much. Look, I played Kerbal Space Program once and my life has never been the same. I have lost so many gems. Oh shit, is that water down there? Yeah, fuck that, I'll be back later. Just don't be like Baby Trav all those years ago and try to get as far as he could without the gravity suit because he didn't even know that the gravity suit was in this game. Uh, did I mention that the gravity suit is in this game yet? That's okay, this wrecked ship is right next to our gunship, so it's not too hard to find once we get back here. Gee, that sounds a lot like another Metroid game. Oh, speak of the devil, gravity anomalies in Fendrana. Y'all ready for some backtracking? You can run, but you can't hide from my fucking missiles, you jet ass pack jet bitch. Well, fuck, he actually outran it. I gotta go eat a shoe. Oh shit, the Shegoths are all grown up now. Big homies make big steppies. Hey everybody, look! Gliders! Speak of the devil! Totally not a weird 3D alternative to the Rippers from the previous games. Or I guess more specifically the Rippers and Super Metroids that let you use them as grapple hook points. Rippers were planned to be in the game, and I assume that the gliders just took their spot. I have no idea why they were cut. They were fully modeled for the game, and can even be set to replace the model of the gliders to restore their intended purpose. I I'm guessing it was done to make it more aesthetically consistent with the area. Since you only see these guys in like three areas in the game, I think. You know, that backtracking wasn't as bad as I remember it being as a kid. Now give me that goddamn purple screw attack, motherfucker. The more I say a swear word, the funnier it is to me. Okay, it's time for one of our favorite games on the show called What If It Was Purple? Let's say it purple. Finally, now I can uh, see underwater. Uh, I, I don't know how that works. And I can move around underwater freely again. So that, that's a kind of important. Great color scheme too, by the way. I, I love it. It's more of a shade of a bluish violet rather than the sex pink from Super Metroid. And the cyan visor and lights complement it so goddamn well. It, it's beautiful. The placement of the gravity suit here does kind of confuse me. Like, why is it placed so unceremoniously in the back corner of Fendrana Drifts? I mean, they explain it with lore that the pirate were experimenting on it. I just wonder what original plans they may have had for this thing. All right, let's grab a couple more funnies before we head back to the Orpheon. Like another cipher artifact. Uh, we'll be needing those and the wave buster after we finish this little puzzle. Uh, well, it's not really a puzzle. It's more of a gate that doesn't let you pass if you don't have enough super missiles to take this whole ass tower down. Trying to make these shots in between these oculi is really tricky with the GameCube controller is what I said when I was younger and I would overthink this whole thing. I know, I know, skill issue, whatever. Let's get our wave buster. I did it, guys! I got the funny Ghostbuster weapon that, ironically, doesn't work on ghosts. That is so crazy. Let's dive back in, ladies, gentlemen, and NBs, because I've got some unfinished business inside the Orpheon's corpse. Actually, not really. We're just passing through it. Why does a sapsack have a unique scan log from the rest of them? There's no images on the side. This is completely unique. I wonder if I could still activate these conduits without the thermal visor. Oh, hell yeah! I don't know how any of this could get any better! <gasps> Talon Crab! It is now time for Crab.
Oh, that didn't take very long. Aqua Pirates, making their one and only appearance down here in the crashed Orpheon, combining their jetpacks with reversed engineer gravity suit tech. And that's not even the best part. These guys take four missiles instead of three. <laughs> Oh shit, did you see that? You see Samus's eyes reflect in her own visor? I had to find some excuse to bring that up in the video because I know someone would get upset if I didn't. How many people in the early 2000s do you think had their first hit of gender dysmorphia when they saw this? I mean, it's one thing to see Samus outside of the suit, but seeing your own eyes reflect, that's bound to crack a couple eggs at least. I think the funniest part here is that it's not even Samus's mission to interrupt whatever they might be salvaging. Samus is just passing through like this goddamn juggernaut and they're shitting themselves every time they see her. I hope you like the Metroid Prime equivalent of Switch Hunt because that's what we're going to be doing for basically the entire crashed Orpheon. Which, you know, makes sense. We need to power this ship back up so we can progress. It's just a little annoying. Maybe it's just my ADHD brain. I know that this is meant to be a slower area to break up the tension of the game, but it's just always a part that I never look forward to replaying. Not because it's bad, it just feels weirdly paced. I shit my pants! <laughs> Hey, I've had days like that too, dude. Don't let it get to you. Never get the queso from Del Taco. That shit left me over the toilet for a goddamn week. Oh, great, a mutated sap sack. It's explosive. Well, more explosive. It's at least poetic to come through this area at this point in the game, literally seeing the wreckage that Samus destroyed in lore, albeit somewhat indirectly, and the calming music definitely gives it a unique feeling to the rest of the game. But at the end of the day, we're just using this to get access to the Phazon Mines, objectively the most dangerous region in the game because of all of the experimental pirate tech. Which, speaking of, whew, okay, I don't think it's a good idea to just leave this shit out in the open, though with precious cargo like Phazon in these parts, it's no surprise that the pirates have upped their security. And I know what you're going to ask, could these have prevented the fall of the Orpheon? Probably not, they just take one extra missile to take down. The Phazon Mines are, for the most part, a linear jaunt with linear enemy scaling. A final, almost endgame gauntlet of encounters that we'll need to run through several times because we gotta grab a power-up at the end and then double back again to grab another power-up, leave the area, and then come back one final time. And one of the first new pirate variants we'll be meeting in this gauntlet... ...is purple! Stuff, man. Wave troopers wield reverse engineered wave beam tech, but because of an oversight in their armor, are left only vulnerable to exclusively the beam that they represent. I'm guessing this was made to counter Samus's wave beam because they aren't using the wave beam against me. I guess reverse engineering it to create armor makes more sense in this context, except it, you know, went completely backwards. And this could be said about the rest of the beam based troopers. Yeah, there's one for all four of them. We'll be back to that later. The best part is that they're not immune to each of the effects of each beam charge shots, meaning the purple ones can be easily stun locked with the wave beam, white ones can be frozen and shattered with a missile, and the yellow ones can be one shot with a super missile. It's a nice incentive to make players swap their weapons and even experiment a bit with their beam combos. Oh, that is a big boy. Who do I have the honor of seeing today? Check that out, they finally figured out the elite pirate thing. We'll be fighting them soon, for now they're just a little sleepy. Though the lore really wants to hype them up for us. Mounted artillery, beam cannon attracting wristbands, likely reverse engineered from the Shegoths. They make up the perfect mini boss for a kitted out Samus, which the pirates seem to be completely aware of. It's flat out confirmed in these computers that they're freaking out ever since they found out that Samus made landfall on Talon 4. And as they say in their logs, she is... <laughs> How the fuck does this mining laser work? Did the pirates have to aim this themselves or did they put a bowling ball in these spinners to aim it? I wanna see how the pirates use this. Why is it like this? 
I remember getting stuck in the spider ball tower for the longest time as a kid. I would always turn it with a morph ball bomb, jump out of it, and then go up the tower to see if it connected to where I needed to go. I don't think it was until my third playthrough of this game as a kid that I noticed the hologram off to the side here that shows you its current configuration. Granted, I don't think I was in middle school yet at this point. Oh, I've got a gut feeling that this pirate isn't as sleepy as the one we saw before. Okay, well, thank you for the info, but uh, that's not the cannon. Why is the projectile flagged with the scan node? Hey, at least now we could switch to the thermal visor to exclusively target its artillery cannon. Ha! Now you're just a mortal man! Or a, a pirate. Logs suggest that they stole this from, quote, Star Marines. I'm going to assume that Retro Studios didn't get the memo that the Galactic Federation is no longer a coalition of different alien races acting as a Galactic Tribune, and is now a human imperialist Super America faction. Or it could be just a completely unrelated faction. Who knows, the circumstances are kind of weird with this one, and a lot of the lore in this port of the game isn't even really canon. And speaking of canon, here is where we find the first mention of the game's namesake, the Metroid Prime. A Metroid found at the impact site of the Phazon Meteor with no limits to the amount of Phazon that it could safely absorb. And somehow, I repeat, somehow, the pirates managed to contain the damn thing. I'm not entirely sure how a Metroid got here. It could be explained that there were Metroids natively on Talon 4 before the space pirates showed up, or perhaps there were some Metroids stored on the frigate Orpheon that managed to survive the impact on the way down. But this was also like 20 years ago, so I'm not- I, I don't get it. It doesn't add up here. Regardless of that though, why would there be Metroids on Talon 4? For natively if the Chozo didn't bring them here. Or maybe they did, and they excluded the Metroids from the technology that they left behind? I feel like that's the only explanation, because currently, Metroid Prime is sitting inside the Cradle, or the Phazon Meteor that the Cradle is holding up. I know that the trilogy edition of the game does retcon it to explain how the Metroid got to Talon 4, but that's not what this video is about. Regardless, the Metroid Prime broke from their containment, predictably, almost strogifying itself by assimilating its body with their tech and weaponry, all the way down to a biological level. That assimilated tech is now just part of its physiology, even mimicking their own beam trooper tech and creating screens, as they put it, only vulnerable to specific weaponry. That was the final straw for the pirates, believing that it was time to seal this fucker away before it learned to overcome this specific trait while it's still vulnerable. How they got that thing locked inside the impact crater, I have no idea. They do mention that the Metroid Prime is capable of phasing through objects, becoming completely intangible, so it's possible this thing did come from the meteor, just phase out of it for a little snack, went on a ride with the space pirates, and then just crawled back in. I don't know, we'll be seeing it later in the game. Though in research, they managed to create a strain of phase on perfect for mixing into their soldiers, but only as long as they're fed a constant stream of it. Phase on is now all these elite pirates can consume, so it's up to other pirates to mix in nutrients and other shit into it, otherwise known as Mountain Dew Voltage. As we read later on, the best method that they found out for this was creating phase on infused mushrooms, and then just growing giant mushrooms to break down into food for them, which we're going to be using a lot for platforming later on. And also, uh, I think you should just hear this for yourself. Science team is attempting to reverse engineer Samus Aran's arsenal based off of data acquired from her assaults on our forces. Progress is slow, but steady. Command would dearly enjoy turning Aran's weapons against her. We believe we can implement beam weapon prototypes in three cycles. Aran's power suit technology remains a mystery, especially the curious morph ball function. All attempts at duplicating it have ended in disaster. Four test subjects were horribly broken and twisted when they engaged our morph ball prototypes. The science team wisely decided to move on afterward. Ouch! Wait, why is it still playing? We've been investigating her weaknesses as well. Despite millions in research, we haven't been able to figure out why can't she crawl? 
And to add more insult to injury, they also know that Samus has access to their terminals, which has made even funnier knowing how quickly Samus was able to decode their lugs. Bro, I really don't know what to say. I just hold down the left trigger and that's it, man. And when they're not freaking out about Samus, they're having run-ins with the Chozo ghosts, which of course they stand no chance against. They reverse engineered the power beam wrong. It's become so bad that they've issued the Chozo ruins as off limits, which I guess is a good reason to explain why we didn't see any down there despite seeing pirates in every other region in the game. Game. Hey, did you know that Metroids become more aggressive when not held in frigid temperatures? Yeah, crazy thought, right? Seriously, if you didn't figure it out by now that these pirates are fucking idiots that somehow know their way around technology, then you'll figure it out around this point. They are convinced that Samus's gunship is using cloaking tech simply because they just can't find it, which is some incredible arrogance. But with arrogance comes a feeling of superiority. These fuckers keep going on and on about how they'll crush all that oppose them like the space fascists that they they are. And as one of their threats of brute force to overthrow the galaxy is their elite pirate Upsilon, later codenamed the Omega Pirate. A super elite pirate complete with cloaking abilities and the ability to heal itself through absorbing more Phazon. We'll be seeing one of them very soon. Hey, that's a nice power source for that highly unstable dynamo you've got there. Mind if I interface with it? Oh shit, the ghost is packing heat! That would have been a great and also poetic time to use the wave buster, but I completely forgot. Ow. Ow. Holy shit, they've been using power bombs as energy sources? I, I mean, I guess that makes sense. This thing is essentially a tiny nuclear reactor. Uh, yeah, power bombs are here and they're devastating in this game. So devastating that your ammo for these things peaks at eight, even with every expansion collected. I don't use them very offensively for most of the time. It's usually just for clearing debris, but for the few enemies that I do use this thing on, it, <laughs> it it's, it's very fun. All right, so I've got another pitch for that Metal Gear Metroid idea. Oh, looks like I found their Metroids. Be free, my children. Again. Oh, these ones are getting kind of big though, which would be more of a threat if I didn't have the ice beam. Too bad there's nothing we could do in this room for now because we gotta backtrack all the way back to the beginning of the region. The only way to loop us back to the beginning of the map where we started is all the way at the end of the Phazon Mines, which we can't even access yet. So we just gotta go back in a straight path. This is something that, again, really bothered me when I was younger. I, I thought that it really hurt the pacing, but unlike the Orphean, I think that coming back through here with the power bombs does keep this backtrack a bit fresh. And from my point of view, I'm putting these pirates out of their misery, especially since they outlawed pirates Pirates having pets, and that any pirates that didn't turn in their pets for execution would suffer a ration cut. I don't think I'd be able to keep going at that point. That's fucking terrible. And on the topic of points... <laughs> There it is, the last of our arsenal recovered from our time up in the Orpheum. Now let's get that crane powered, shall we? Oh, that's so goofy, I love it. Oh, I remember this shot of the impact crater leaving me in awe as a kid. Of course, it's because I was a dumb child. No shit, the Phazon mines are right next to the edge of the Phazon meteor. This view shouldn't have surprised me, but goddamn did it, and I thought it was fucking cool. You can see a similar view in the Magmore Caverns where it connects to the Phazon mines. It really helps keep this world connected, like a really lesser version of the moon from Majora's Mask. Thankfully, we don't need to backtrack too far into Talon Overworld before we pop back into the mines. We're just here to snag the X-ray visor right after we go up this corkscrew penis spider ball track. Look, it's an iconic piece of Chozo architecture, okay? I 
thought that this shit was so cool as a kid because I would occasionally watch Smallville with my parents. And I remember those scenes where young Clark Kent would see through people's skin and just look at their bones. And I thought, hell yeah, now I could do that too. This is also what makes the Chozo Ghost so incredibly easy. Sure, it's nice of this game that's told me what every destructible object in the game has been made up of all the way to this point in the game to suddenly stop telling me what things are made out of or even give it a scan tag regardless. Motherfucker, I don't have the patience for this great grand cousin EP or in the die. What the fuck were the words that just came out of my mouth? Did I just get possessed? Okay, I kind of lied. We need to backtrack all the way through Magmore for the plasma beam because I forgot that we need that to reach the end of the phase on mines. So I might as well pull a Meridia on this here tube to get the ice spreader real quick. Yeah, our third beam combo. Imagine a super missile, but instead taking 10 missiles instead of five and being more useless against targets that are resistant to the ice beam. I forgot to use this outside of the final boss fight, so it's gonna be a minute before you see me use it. Yeah, I could have gone back and recorded more footage of using this thing before the final boss, but I didn't fucking want to. Now shut up and give me that puzzle music. Let's go! Spin those platforms! Bomb those holes! Okay, that's more than I expected. Look at that fucking full range of motion with the spider ball. This is the only spot in the whole game that's like this, uh, I think. Uh. And now look at what I will take uh, from you. Why is it red? Okay, actually, it makes a bit of sense. This is now a heat-based weapon rather than a weapon that pierces through flesh, electing to incinerate its targets instead. So the red coloring for the heat, yeah, that I, it makes sense. Seriously, the charge shot kills with this thing are uh, unnerving in the best way possible. Fuck it, let's go clean up a bit of Flandrana while we're here. Let me melt your spit. Oh my god, I just killed it by melting the ice on its carapace. That poor little thing, holy shit, that's so fucked up. I might as well try to grab this while I'm here too. Fuck this one specific artifact. There is nothing in your scan visor to tell you where this door is and that it's behind a rock that you need to see with the x-ray scope. The door doesn't even appear on your map until you've opened it once. So I can't blame something like Development Crunch for making this hard to see. This was intentionally hidden from the player. It's bullshit. Fuck this artifact. Hold on, did that trooper just die to fall damage or the phase on? Oh shit, I forgot to scan him too. It feels so wrong being at this point in the mines and still only fighting off basic ass Metroids. Now would be a perfect spot to introduce one of its variants, which is exactly what they did in later releases of the game. It can't be too much longer, right? I say knowing exactly where they appeared. I'm guessing the pirates did reverse engineer those glider things for their cloaking tech for these platforms. Maybe it's just a side effect of working on the Omega Pirate, but what's the point of having invisible platforms in your science lab? Is it to navigate around while not startling the Metroids? I don't think they really care that much. I mean, we see that bombus down here are cloaked as well, so clearly it's deliberate. Oh, there they are. You guys are a little late. Oh, oh, I hate it. Hunter Metroids, the first of two Metroid variants will be meeting. And in any other version of the game, you would have met them by now. They're exactly what the lore in the Fendrana Hydra Labs foreshadowed. Weaker Metroids with a longer range that are just as susceptible to being frozen and shattered with missiles. If anything, I think that this makes them less dangerous than their green friends. Wait, hold on, why is this area so cold? Was this an accident or was there a last ditch attempt to control the Metroids down here? Whatever, it makes for a really dramatic door opening, which I'm never against. 
I'm guessing that means we're nearing one of the big boys. Yep, there he is! Or at least one of them, because the phase on has started breaking down the Omega Pirate's cellular structure, giving them a shorter lifespan. Alright, well that's one and done. Good thing we're out here, and he's in there, and I just remembered... Yep, he sure looks like a bigger elite pirate. Uh, also a Decepticon, or more specifically, Jolt from Revenge of the Fallen. Uh, you know, the product placement one? Uh, okay, I realize that barely narrows it down. Also, I think he was an Autobot. You can take this guy down pretty quick with a power bomb, right? I've never seen that before. This guy really is just an elite pirate with extra steps. Rather than targeting the head, you have to take out the phazon deposits on each of his limbs. But the attacks he uses is all stuff that we've seen before. Destroying all four of his phazon deposits leaves him vulnerable after he calls for reinforcements while he recharges in one of the room's phazon pools. You can only see him with the x-ray visor, but a few super missiles is usually enough to make quick work of the guy. He can even let you hit him more than once. This is roughly where I believe the original meta Kraid fight was supposed to take place. The one and only official model shown for the guy shows him next to those massive mushrooms the pirates grow for the Omega Pirates. And given that this boss recycles a lot of an existing enemy's moveset, I think that it's fair that Kraid was planned to be the boss of these parts, and that the Omega Pirate was whipped up quickly from the Elite Pirate as a way to save time. Though I'm really curious how they would have handled Kraid giving Samus the Phazon suit. Why is it red? Shouldn't the Phazon suit be blue? I mean, I'm not gonna say that the suit doesn't look badass because it, it really is, but nothing about this screams Phazon. This design choice was more so to bring out the aggressive nature of Phazon, this substance that's all corrupting, something to even drive ghosts mad. And because this was the early 2000s and black and red color schemes was all over the place, that's just what they decided on. Oh, Clifford, I'm so sorry to lump you into this. Now, a blue and teal Phazon suit was originally planned as the Phazon on suit, which I think looks absolutely gorgeous. This color palette can actually be seen in-game via hacking if you use an all-inventory cheat during the Orphean opening cutscene. It even has glowing highlights around it that you don't see in this model when pulled into a 3D model viewer. And if you ask me, that sounds really familiar to Metroid Prime 3, but if they wanted to go with this theme of corruption and madness, yeah, I, I understand why they went with this final suit design. It doesn't look bad by any means. It kind of makes me think of Samus getting taken by the Venom symbiote or something. The Phazon suit grants us even more layers of protection, as well as full immunity from blue Phazon, which means that we could grab that missile tank that we were locked out of shortly before this fight. Oh, did I say missile tank? I meant a mandatory artifact behind enough bomb blocks for Samus to die without the Phazon suit. Wow, that does not look safe. At least for our time and opening the loop up for the phase on mines, we are given our final energy tank of the run. Really, that's it. All we've got left in terms of plot is to reconstruct the cipher to make our way into the meteor. Except we still need those artifacts to assemble the cipher, so that's what we gotta do. Wake up, big guy, I need your artifact. Why do you look like that? All right, now don't forget the most important item in the game while you're down here, the flamethrower. Oh, this thing sucks, I don't like it. I don't even have footage of using it against Metroid Prime, I just forgot I had it. Goodbye, phase on Mines, I really won't miss you. Hello, Birdman, I'm here for my final plasma offerings.
And there it is, almost every artifact in the game. You don't have to worry, I always leave the one inside the cradle for last. I am a dumbass though, I forgot to grab the power bomb expansion at the very top of the same room with that bullshit x-ray plasma door for the artifact. Somehow I always forget about this. Whatever, that should be about everything. Let's cap this adventure off with one more ass shake before I wrap things up. God bless that floating rock and all the Chozo lore that it came with. And also this pirate log where they bitch about not being able to enter the impact crater. It sucks to suck, motherfuckers, but I beat you to it. At least something was 100% about this run. I swear that I'm cursed to never have a proper 100% scans run. Oh, you son of a bitch, I should have known. The pirates knew that Samus would succeed in reconstructing the cipher so that they could swoop in at the last second and take the meteor for themselves. Is what I thought as a kid, because Ridley destroying the statues that bear the path to inside the meteor doesn't make any sense. Oh god, the aspect ratio! Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain as I fix this shit. Oh god, now I became the man behind the curtain. Uh, okay, I, I really wish that I had something to say about this fight, but Ridley spends so much time just flying out of reach and padding out the fight that I just end up getting really fucking bored. Yeah, just super missile his chest whenever you can, and eventually the dude will have to make an emergency landing, kicking off the second phase of the fight. Yeah, real tough now without your wings, are you, big guy? Your wings that got burned off despite being energy. Sure, okay. At least phase two is a bit more engaging. I see why so many folks try to skip this by boost balling into his chest to almost instantly kill him. You have to blast his face whenever he opens his mouth so that you could expose his chest. It's the same game with a couple extra steps. It's pretty lame that this is one of the lesser fights in Metroid Prime. The one that's built up from the beginning of the game, Samus's arch nemesis. I mean, at least he looks kind of badass. Meta Ridley, from my perspective, is just about as iconic as Ridley himself. Just please make this fight end. I could really use some divine intervention. Thanks, Dad. All right, I need someone to explain how these ghosts are able to help us right now. Is the last of the energy from the artifacts giving them the strength to fight their phase on madness in their 11th hour or some bullshit? I mean, it's kind of badass regardless. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a date with a worm. <laughs> Mmm, this is, uh, very red. It's kind of a shame that this concept of red Phazon is never revisited in the series after this. Or maybe it's for the best, because this is where we meet our final Metroid variant that isn't Metroid Prime itself. Fission Metroids, an enemy that taught me what the word fission meant and also had me confuse it with diffusion because of Metroid Fusion. Not only do these guys infinitely respawn from the red Phazon below, which would make sense if they stuck with the plot point of the Phazon being pure Metroid juice, but these things have mastered the power of mitosis, splitting themselves into two smaller Metroids, each color-coded to tell you which beam to use on them. It's my own personal headcanon that when the Metroid Prime infused itself with some of the pirate tech, that it somehow passed this trait down biologically. These fuckers even bred themselves an immunity to being frozen, all on their own too. I mean, kind of indirectly with the space pirates help, though because they're still Talon Metroids, that means they're vulnerable to power bombs and not a threat to the universe as we know it.
Hey, why am I platforming on giant teeth? Is this where all of my baby teeth go when I put them under my pillow? Because I never got quarters under my pillow, just more teeth. You know, I got my wisdom teeth out earlier this year and my dentist just shoved a metal stick next to them and pushed them out. I will never forget the crunching sound that it made. Oh, what's this? One last spider ball puzzle before the final boss? Nah, I'm good. <laughs> Oh shit, sorry, I must have the wrong room. I was looking for Metroid Prime, not a giant enemy spider. <laughs> Wait, that thing is Metroid Prime? Oh, you know, I could actually kind of see it now. It assimilated the Beam Trooper tech and I could kind of see the shape of their helmet in this thing's head. I think I'm more thrown off by its eyes. I never took a Metroid for needing optic nerves, glands, whatever. What is organs? What is an eye considered? Why does it have a nose? The fight is surprisingly simple. Swap your beam to the same color as its glowing bits and avoid its projectiles. Occasionally you'll need to morph ball under it when it rushes you. Which, hey, this fight finally gives us a reason to go nuts with our beam combos. Who you gonna call? The Nut Booster. Every time I hit this thing with the ice spreader, I think of a cat with a slice of cheese slapped on its face. It's not entirely frozen, it's just its face. Why does it just freeze like that? Who are you? Ah! No, please! Ah! Now that looks way closer to a Metroid. Again, with eyes. Maybe that's why it looks like that. It spent too much time working out at the library and reading books. Oh my God, the worm is a bookworm. I get it now. Holy shit, did you see that? She did the pose from the promotional material. It's not the box art. The box art is a different pose. That's kind of cool though. Wait, I was fucking wrong. That's the Japanese box art. I am very smart. Now watch me suplex this nuclear jellyfish. Okay, so do you remember in Super Metroid how Mother Brain was only killable with the Hyper Beam and became one of the most badass power trips in the 90s? Imagine that fight with only the Hyper Beam and no power trip. Only attacks from a phazon infused arm cannon can hurt this, the logbook says, which could render this thing nigh invincible if it didn't need to literally shit out pools of phazon that I could just channel through my suit. This sounds fine on paper and wouldn't be an issue if I didn't have to play the most boring game of nuclear jump rope while I wait for the next shipment of liquid goo to send through my gun. Whose idea was it to make a jellyfish that shits liquid meth? But after the next 12 times I do this, it becomes less cool. Yeah, this is a pretty fucking lame final boss. This thing's only attack is its shockwaves, which are so predictable that I could just listen for the sound cue and dodge it without even needing to use the appropriate visor. The closest thing this fight has to difficulty is when you select the wrong visor by accident when you're supposed to be shooting it with the hyper beam. I mean, sure, sometimes it summons baby Metroids after you, but you can just take them out with the power bomb. And you do all of this for about five or six minutes or so, which isn't the end of the world, but this is the final boss and is such a lame way from a gameplay standpoint to cap off this incredible journey. You can make this fight even easier and avoid its shockwave attacks altogether by standing on Prime's exoskeleton. But why do I want to make this fight even more mind numbing? Come on, I'm starting to lose my voice. Fuck, man, if it's that important, you can just have the phase on suit. Fuck you, man. Oh, no escape sequence. Yeah, that's cool. 
have done it, I think. The source of the great poison has been slain, and the very worm that has poisoned the land and woke the dead is nothing but goo. I kind of admit though, from a story point of view, the game really does just end. There's very little of substance here, just a mid-final boss that's built up as this destroyer of worlds as our bookend. And the cradle meant to contain this great poison is left in ruins. There's really no reason to be celebrating. Unless there's some log in the game that says with the destruction of the Metroid Prime that all Phazon would cease to exist, but that that's not the case. The great poison is left to fester in the crater. It's pretty cool that we get to see Samus's head in full 3D view if you beat the game with more than 75% items. I mean, you see the back of her head regardless even if you don't meet this criteria, but 75 and above, you get that full view. It doesn't look nearly as good today. You could thank the game being upscaled for that, but as a kid, seeing this on a CRT TV, I thought this was a real person's head just superimposed in between the model. It could just be rose-tinted nostalgia, but I think that there's a little bit of merit to CRTs making some older games look better, especially a generation behind on the PlayStation. I'll get to the 100% ending here in just a moment. Yes, I love this game to death, even despite its messy third act, and remains one of my favorite games in the series as a contender for one of my favorite games of all time. But even I can admit that there's some issues here. But it's good to remember, Samus's power suit is symbiotic, an organism in its own right, and with a substance as all-corrupting as Phazon, well... <laughs> Thank you so much for making it to this point in the video, especially if you watched part one beforehand. I originally wanted to have part two out a week after I released part one, but for several reasons, I couldn't meet that time frame. The charity event, as well as starting a new medication, knocked me out for a couple of weeks and I just couldn't edit during that time. We did end up raising about $25,000 for diabetes research, so I mean, it's not like it was all for nothing. I especially want to thank my $10 plus patrons because you guys helped me stay financially afloat during that time. Dante Bishop, Seth31123, Three, Freedom 19, Nickel, EMC Mend, Dragon XRD, Silk, Lockwe, Super Mango Man, Cloud Connection, I Am the Pokemon Master, Otaku de Carnitas, Pixel Pockets, Slim Jim's Media Bin, EMT Neutrino, and Chef Kilo. Thank you both new and old supporters for your continued support. Just remember that you can join the Trav Guide Discord server for as low as $1 a month over on my Patreon, or debatably for free through a Twitch Prime subscription. And I look forward to seeing you guys there and hearing your thoughts on my next projects. I will see you then.